Ah, uh, good morning. Morning. Yeah, welcome to Singapore. <laughs> and and welcome to the Red Dot Ruby Conf 2017. And uh, this is my, I don't know, fourth conference here? I don't know, fourth or fifth. Uh, may I ask you a question? A few questions. Uh, how many of you are developers? Uh, almost all of them, thank you. How many programmers? A little bit less, thank you. Uh, how many of you uh, consider yourself as uh, creators? Okay, fine. Okay, we fellow creators. I'm going to talk about uh, creating software and the setting goals and the result, uh, result they accomplish those goals. Okay, we create software. In creating software, what is the goal? Uh, my personal goal is not related to software, be a good father. <laughs> uh, as a father of four children, so uh, being a good father is quite simple goal, right? Quite simple goal. But uh, sometimes it's hard to accomplish a simple goal like a, being a good father, but uh, uh, there are so many uh, reasons to fail, like a wrong priority, or maybe uh, you know, short temper, or something like that. So there are many reasons to fail. And uh, our software goal is to create great software. And uh, simple, but uh, it's kind of hard to create great software. We have to define great. We have to uh, try very hard to create the great software. Uh, especially when software has become popular. So we have so many burden in the history of the uh, development of software. For example, with Ruby, uh, our simple goal is make the language better, right? So our we core team, the Ruby core team, working very, 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 very hard to make Ruby language better. But uh, sometimes that kind of simple goal is pretty, pretty difficult uh, to accomplish. Because Ruby is so popular, so that, that's the reason we have so many people here in, in the audience. And uh, it has, Ruby has helped so many developers all over the world, in Singapore, in the United States, in Japan, of course, India, or Malaysia, or Europe, or so, so many countries. So uh, it has helped many com uh, developers, probably more than a million developers all over the world. And uh, in the, beside that, Ruby has survived for 25 years. Like, uh, you know, it's quite rare for software project to survive more than 20 years. But, uh, you know, Ruby survives 25 years. So the, so many software were written in Ruby. So you write software in Ruby, you write software in Ruby. There are tons of software written in Ruby. So in that sense, so compatibility matters for Ruby because even the slightest, slightest change, even the teeny bit of the compatibility breakage would break thousands of software. So we need compatibility. Uh, in fact, Ruby has a lot of technical debt. For example, so I am a mere human. So in design of Ruby, I made some mistakes or gadgets or something. And so I sometimes I regret them. So that I feel some kind of trouble. So that. I want to resolve those kind of troubles by breaking compatibility. So the, in, a, in the soft design of software or in design of languages, so the designers sometimes want to uh, change the language or software in better way by breaking uh, compatibility. 
For example, we had some kind of huge breakage in between the Ruby 1.8 and Ruby 1.9. It was more than 10 years ago. But uh, it, is, it is a good thing. So we replaced the, we replaced the virtual machine that makes Ruby a uh, few times faster. And then we introduced some kind of uh, the multi-language things so that we can safely use the so many encodings, the strings encodings, like a Unicode and SIFJS in Japan, or maybe in the Big Five in Taiwan, or some, some other encodings. So the, uh, the Ruby 1.9 and Ruby 2 supports the more than 80 encodings all over the world. So that kind of change was needed. But at the same time, the breakage we brought uh, stopped evolution. There are so many people stay using the old 1.8 for a long, long time. So we, need, we needed more than five years to, as a community to migrate toward 1.9 after we released 1.9. So the, those five years, the the, at least the half of the community was slowed down in the improvement from the improvement of the language and the, the implementation, implementation of the runtime. So the, that five years is kind of a waste of time for us. The Python was even worse. <laughs> they took more than 10 years. Or PHP, they even canceled PHP 6. So the people who is working on the PHP so created the new, whole new language without compatibility, named the PHP 6. But uh, it was, the gap was so huge. And then no one in the community, virtually no one in the community chose the PHP 6. So they just gave up. The similar things happened in ECMAScript 4. So they gave up ECMAScript 4. So it's, it's called second system syndrome. So when we have trouble with the current system, we just get mad and then throw away the first version, then we recreate the second version, which is whole new and far better, and no one used them. So the, we have learned we have to move on step by step. Gradual change is the way to go. So that we have to, by uh, to accomplish the goals, we shouldn't throw away our current systems, current software. Then we have to gradually improve our systems. And then we have to set up the simple goals and then we accomplish them one by one. Okay, let me show you a case study of accomplishing a simple goal for Ruby. Uh, last year, two years ago, actually two, almost two years ago, so I give, give up this kind of slogan, model, or key phrase, named Ruby 3x3. That means that uh, we want to make Ruby 3 three times faster. You know, you know that so many people inside of outside of the Ruby community complained about the slow, slowness of the Ruby language. Look, in most of the case, so Ruby is fast enough. That's the reason you use Ruby, right? But uh, you know, the comparing Ruby to say C++ or maybe Java or I don't know, the, and then in, under the very simple micro benchmarks, Ruby is slow. Yeah, the the looping million times, the the empty million times empty loops, you know, a few hundred times slower than C++, of course. But uh, 
in a real world application, Ruby is not that slow. But, uh, you know, the, but at the same time, no one complains about the, the faster Ruby. You know, if you Ruby got fast, so everyone's going to be happy, except, for, except us. <laughs> <laughs> so the faster Ruby, the make Ruby faster, that is the simple goal. It seems straightforward and pretty simple. Okay, making Ruby fast. Uh, but uh, technically, it is difficult. You know, the, we, have been, we have been working on Ruby virtual machine for the last tw more than 20 years. So the, we, all, we have already picked the low hanging fruit. So we have to do something very drastically to make, it, make Ruby fast, uh, fast for three times. So actually, far more difficult than you may think. Uh, because we have some kind of hidden rules or maybe regulations. The hard part is, of course, the hard part is the compatibility. We have to keep compatibility even though the Ruby is faster. The second one is the memory usage. Uh, in general, the software performance is, the, is kind of the time and space trade-off. So you Usually, when you make your software faster, your software will consume the more memory. Uh, for example, JRuby, thanks to the JVM, uh, JRuby is faster than CRuby in most of the cases, except for startup times. Yeah, that's, that's great, great things, thanks to the JVM. But uh, at the same time, JRuby consumes more memory. Uh, in micro benchmarks, it consumes a hundred, hundred times more memory. Or it, it consumes the 17 more, time, more memory on the art carrot benchmark, which is relatively big benchmark and uh, some, somewhat realistic benchmark. We will talk about art carrot later. So the but uh, the Ruby language may run on um, memory tight environment like a uh, Heroku smallest dino. I happen to work for Heroku. <laughs> so the the it is very important for me to to ensure the Ruby would work work uh will run, run uh, safely on the smallest dino with a 520 meg of memory. Or a decent PC has only to have the two gigabyte memory. Okay, your developers, you, your PC may have the 16 gig or maybe 20, 24 gigs of memory. Oh, but the, the for the more mere PC users, the decent PC only has the two gig, gig of memory. Or well, a few years back, the two gigs is big memory. Or even in, on the embedded system, some people try to uh, run Ruby software on top of the smaller computers, like a Raspberry Pi, or maybe the Lego Mindstorm, or maybe the teeny embedded embedding board, like a, with a one meg of memory. So at least it should be configurable to use less memory. That's the first rule. As the, I'm, the, I'm the second rule, memory usage. So that we want to make Ruby faster, but at least the, the faster Ruby can be configured to use less memory, like as the current Ruby implementation. The, the third, one, third hidden rule is dependency. So Ruby is a long-lived project. The, it's, it's 24 years old. Uh, old, so I started the, the developing Ruby on uh, February twenty fourth, nineteen ninety three. So the in on uh, next February, Ruby will turn to twenty five. Whoa! <laughs> so the depend 
for Ruby, depending on the outside project, is dangerous. Uh, the, for, for example, so the, to make Ruby faster, so we can rely on the, these projects like LLVM, LibJet, GNU Lightning, but uh, w we don't have control over those software. So the, these are the third party software. And then it is, you know, we, can con we cannot control them unless you are an Apple. If you are Apple, you can buy that, that software. <laughs> so that those software may have bugs, so that they may not put you, our issues on priority. The project may be abandoned. So, so that we may need to fork it, or we have to maintain those kind of huge third-party software by ourselves, which is nearly impossible. So that this is kind of silly things, but uh, very few projects survived more than 20 years ago. So that if we once we rely on the third-party uh, huge project. We have to take care of. The, we might have to take care of them in the future. So, the programming language lived far longer than other software. Like, a, you know, the Fortran was born in 54, 1954. The the Lisp was born in 58. So, but uh, those languages still survives. The Ruby is 24 years old. It, 24 year old, and then, but I assume Ruby will be survived for coming 20 years, next 20 years, or maybe next 50 years. So the, we just don't want to rely on the third party project, which live, you know, sh far, long, far shorter than the Ruby itself. The, also, we need to have the maintainability. So overall maintainability matters. So because unmaintainable code stops evolution. So the, if we stop evolution, so that the, we, the, as a community, the gradually dies. So we have to keep on moving. So the, the maintainability matters. So these are our, our you know, restriction, regulation, and hidden rules. And then we, I must add some kind of the easy part to so make our goals easy, which is one of them is a baseline. So the, our baseline of three times faster is compared to Ruby 2.0, which is uh, which was released in uh, 2013, which is four years ago, not the 2.4, which we released in last year. So the, we have done a lot of improvement during the, uh, since the Ruby 2.0. So we implemented the generation of garbage collectors. We, added the in, we have added incremental garbage collectors. And then last year, we have added the open address hash table, which, is, uh, which runs faster for the hash tables and the method lookup, and a lot of other improvements. And then we have the last, last four years, we have uh, five to 10% improvement in performance and memory usage each year. We have done a good job for the last, last few years. So the Ruby 2.4 is faster than Ruby 2.0. Then Ruby 2.4 consumes less memory, slightly less memory than Ruby 2.0. So we want to include these improvements in the, you know, the three by three measurement. So this is this is one uh, hidden regulation, which makes our goal a little bit easier. Okay, second rule, uh, second uh, regulation is no micro benchmarks. Micro benchmarks is pretty interesting. Like uh, we have the, some kind of shootout games to comparing, compare the, the performance of the languages. But uh, they only gains. 
you know, the measuring the the tiny loop or you know the finding so by the searching through the binary tree is quite interesting game. But uh, you know that not usually reflect the real world behavior. So real world application behave differently from micro benchmarks. So the in the measurement of Ruby three by three, so we have to build some kind of standard benchmarks. So the standard benchmarks need to be very uh, real world. Re that reflects real world. It, it, they are artificial, but uh, they have to reflect real world behavior. So that we uh, introduced the two kind of new benchmarks. W one is the web application benchmark, which is on top of Rails, because most of people use Ruby to on top of Rails, right? Unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Rails programmers, raise your hand. Okay, that's the reason. <laughs> so the, the, this kind of benchmark is based on this course. And then you can find your benchmark here. GitHub.com, Noah Gibbs, Rails Ruby Bench. So we, we are having, we are, we are under the process of improving this kind of in, benchmark that could be in, uh, in, that can be in, installed very easily, and you can measure the performance very easily. So this kind of benchmark is the, done by Noah Gibbs, which is uh, hired by the Appfolio company, which hires him as a, uh, working for the improving Ruby full time. The another uh, the another benchmark is the opt carrot. Our benchmark. Opt carrot stand, stands for the carrot for optimization. Uh, I don't know about the other culture, but it's at least in Japan, carrot stands for uh, you know tempting bite for horses. You know, you put the carrot on, on t uh, in front of the horse, the ho like a, like this, the horse runs. The ch chasing carrot, so that can the host can run very very fast. So the opt carrot try to be a carrot for Ruby three by three. So it's a we pursue to improve the the performance of the opt carrot benchmark, so the Ruby will go going to be faster. The opt carrot is the uh, NES emulator, Nintendo Entertainment System emulator. So you can play, say, Mario <laughs> using the Opta Carrot. They try to uh, implement, uh, accomplish the six frames per second by, you know, the dynamic interpreted reversal machine. So uh, you can find Opta Carrot here, GitHub.com, Mame, Opta Carrot. Uh, the the Opti Carrot is uh, written by the, this guy, Yusuke Endo, which is an uh, insanely genius guy. <laughs> so the, we have the hidden regulation. We have the baseline of the Ruby 2.0, and we don't use the, the micro benchmarks to measure Ruby 3x3. Three three. OK, that, there are all the regulations. Memory usage, dependency, the maintainability, the baseline, the no micro benchmarks. So the Ruby 3x3 three three, under these regulations, how hard they are. I consider Ruby 3x3 three three as uh, nearly impossible. <laughs> <coughs> Yeah, we need some kind of the, the fresh technology. Name Jet. Yeah, we have the tons of other optimization uh, to the the virtual machine, but the, the I'm expecting Jet can be a very very uh, useful in uh, improving the performance. The Jet stands for the just in time compilation. 
So the, some languages use LLVM to implement JIT, like Rubinius, Crystal, Julia. These languages use LLVM to, to make these languages faster. So it is portable. So it runs on any OS and C many OS and many CPU. And then the LLVM is highly optimized. The code generated by LLVM is quite uh, quality and uh, highly optimized. And then, but uh, uh, the JIT API sometimes changes. So we have to follow these changes. And then the LLVM is a huge third party uh, software. So we have the problem or anxiety of dependency. We have other uh, JIT libraries, like a lib, a lib JIT or GNU Lightning. So the, these libraries are less widely used, and it comes with the, the lesser GPL, which is not fully compatible with the, our, uh, our license, which is the BSD. And then, we, have, we also have that anxiety of dependency. So we have been uh, considering adding JIT to the language for a long, long time. And then the only option we can, could think of without these kind of uh, problems is the writing our own JIT, which is very, very difficult. So that we were having trouble for a long, long time. But uh, early this year, the other option came in, MJIT. Uh, MJIT stands for MRI JIT, straightforward. <laughs> you can find the branch with MJIT here. GitHub, VN Markov, RubyTree, LTL, MJIT branch. It's done by the Vladimir and Makarov, did I pronounce it right? <laughs> Who is working for Red Hat? And then the Vladimir is the author of the open address hash table we have introduced uh, last year. So the MJIT is a little bit different approach. Uh, MJIT uses LTL, MJIT uses the the straightforward GCC or Clang, and then just, uh, MLang uses method JIT. Let me explain a little bit more about that. So LTL stands for the Register Transfer Language. So the, it, it is kind of the, the bytecode or the abstract uh, instructions for abstract machine, and then it's based on the register. In the, in the world of the, the virtual machine imp, uh, implementation, so there are long history of uh, for argument between the, the stack-based internal representation and the register-based internal representation. So the stack-based IR means the this kind of things. So the get local up the get local variable, which is the part of the YAL uh, instructions. So the, you can take the, the look value of the local variable of B index into the stack. Then the another local variable into the stack. Then at the plus uh, operation, consuming two stack entries. Then the push the result in the in on the on top of the stack. Then you put the the value, the stack top value to the local variable in A index. That kind of things. Like a, it's kind of like a fourth in a stack based language. And the register based IR, which is the Okay, the value of A, and you plus value of A and the value of B into the value of C. So much simpler, but uh, implement implementation-wise, so the, the register-based IR is much, much more uh, complicated. So the, 
you know, both sides have the pros and cons. So there's no clear uh, winner in this argument. And then Yaov, <coughs> the current VM, Yaov stands for the yet another Ruby VM. <laughs> the Yaov stands for, uh, Yaov uses stack-based IO. Like, JVM uses stack-based IO. Okay, uh, for your information, the MRuby, the alternative implementation of Ruby, uh, also uses register-based IO. Anyway, the stack-based IO is simpler and the stack-based IR is shorter in, in terms of the, the size of the, the compiled bytecode. The, the register-based IR creates less interactions. Okay. The size of the code is smaller in stack-based. The number of instructions are s the smaller in stack register-based IR. And in addition, the register-based IR creates less memory traffic, so you can access less memory. And the register-based IRs claimed to run faster. So that, you know, there's, as I said before, that there's no clear winner in the, the stack-based IR and the register-based IR. But at least for Z purpose, so that the register-based IR is easier to implement JIT on top of it, and the register-based IR is less, a little bit easier to implement the, the, the optimization. So he chose the new the virtual machine interactions, on, which is register-based. So the, the Vladimir uh, re replaced Yelp by his RTL virtual machine which is not perfect yet, but uh, it's working. And uh, as far as under the current implementation, so his LTL virtual machine is run as fast as 2.4. It's not slow. And uh, it consumes almost same memory amount as the, re the current virtual machine. So the you know, the step of the Ruby makes three times faster, so the, you know, the same performance is not satisfied. So you might feel unsatisfied by the same performance, same memory footprint. But the important thing is that, you know, you don't have the performance degradation and then you don't con uh, consume the baseline of the memory footprint. So the, we have the new virtual machine with the register based. Then he implemented JET on top of the RTL. The, the, the architecture is like this. Uh, the, the figure is a little bit small. But uh, fundamentally, <laughs> uh, the MZ, MZ here, uh, generate C code into files, then compile those C code by GCC or Clang as a normal uh, compilation step, then generate the dot .so, uh, dot .so file, shared object file, then load dynamically those SO files into Ruby to implement JET, which is which is a nice idea. <laughs> it is not straightforward. Usually, JIT creates the, the instruction in memory, then called the function we generate in the memory. But uh, he, cre he used the file systems and uh, the user comp uh, compilers to compile JIT files. So the, we, in, under the current implementation, we generate the, the YAV code, which is uh, in, in memory. Then we execute the, those uh, in-memory YAV code, right? Those, we compile Ruby code into the YAV code, then execute uh, YAV code by the virtual, YAV virtual machine. So <coughs> by 
MZ, MZ <coughs> the baseline is you get read the Ruby code, then compile Ruby code into the RTL, which is the, the register based virtual machine code, then execute the, the RTL by the RTL virtual machine, which is straightforward and then quite si similar to YELF. But uh, once you turn off the Z option, so MZ creates the RTL, then generates C code into file from RTL, then compile those C, C code by GCC, then load compiled uh, SO file, then execute that function. So benefit. So the, we don't have no tricky dependency. So GCC is independent. Of course, GCC is uh, the third party software, but uh, which is live far longer than Ruby. The first version of Ruby in 93 was compiled by GCC. So GCC is old enough. Besides that, so the, you know, the compilation steps is well defined. So it, it is, it's so stable. So it hasn't changed for last, I don't know, 30, 40 years. So we can rely on them to the next 20 years. And then the, those compilers are very stable and the GCC is ubiquitous. You can, you can have the GCC on Linux, Mac, Windows, or maybe in the, on the embedded devices. So at least you can have uh, the C compiler um, so many systems. The, by that reason, so the MZ is pretty much portable and highly optimized. But we also have tricks. Uh, so the point is, it is so many unnecessary steps compared to the, the other jet. So the, you have to minimize headers. So in the build process, we create a minimized header. Uh, he claims that we can cut the 90% of the, the Ruby headers. Then, oops. And then he used the worker threads to create the, uh, the JIT code. So the JIT compilation process is, the, is done by the separate thread from the, the, the mainline threads. So that you can use the, the multi-core to, to JIT compile. So as a result, default RTL is as fast as Ruby, and the default RTL consumes as less memory as we have, the current implementation, and MJIT runs far faster than YAV. MJIT consumes more memory than YAV, of course. And then you can do the ahead of time compile, ahead of time compilation. So you can compile all the Ruby files into the machine code, then roll them into the, the virtual machine to run your Ruby code in C. It's not comparable to plain C code written by human, but uh, it's faster than the, Ruby, the, the plain Ruby. And then uh, we can have the future of so drastic inlining, which makes the, the compiled code even faster, or maybe the weird planning about the speculative JIT, which can assuming that, okay, this argument must be integers. So you can compile these numbers as integers without any the, the converting back and forth with the Ruby world and C world. So by using these kind of the, the technique and ideas, the MJ can be even faster. Of course, MJ has drawbacks, which is the higher compiler cost. You know, the, the process is the generating C code, executing the compiler, the passing C code, the code generated, gen, 
code generate from generate code from C code, then the dynamic loading dot so file, which is all of them are unnecessary for the the usual JIT, like a uh, lib using libjet or other JIT technologies. So these kind of the things are the you know the burden to the performance. But uh, we they are trying he is trying to the minimize this kind of the burden. So overall result MJIT runs far faster than YALF. MJIT consumes more memory than YALF, as I told you. Okay. MJIT runs faster than JRuby, and MJIT consumes far less memory than JRuby. Okay, under the micro benchmarks, which are a lot of, lot of uh, words, okay, MJIT runs six times faster than Ruby 2.0 in average. The MJIT consumes four times more memory. As a reference, JRuby is around 2.5 faster than Ruby 2.0, and the JRuby consumes 200 times more memory in micro benchmarks. In auto carrot benchmark, MJIT runs 2.8 times faster and uh, consumes 1.16, 16 times more memory. As a reference, JRuby runs 2.4 times faster than Ruby 2.0, and JRuby comes 18 times more memory. Okay. Under the, the real world example, the, the difference is not that big. You know, that not six times, not 200 times. So, but evalu evaluation is, MZ is very promising. But uh, it still has some issues. We cannot replace the MZ, uh, our virtual machine by MZ yet. But uh, it's promising. We, we need more words. So we don't make any promise. We don't make any promise that we might not have the Ruby MZ as uh, the jet engine for Ruby 3, but at least we already have the implemented technology to make Ruby three times faster. And then the MZ achieves the highest in our client area. Okay, we're trying to make the other Ruby 3 magics, like a multi-core concurrency or type inferences. Okay, I, I'm not going to talk about them today, but uh, and those simple goals have hidden rules and regulations and limitations, and they are so difficult to implement. So I can now, I only say that today, but uh, we have tons of work to do that, to make Ruby better. Conclusion, uh, accomplishing a simple goal can be extremely difficult. A lot of hidden trade-offs and regulations, but it's a, a, a way of creation. We are creators, right? <laughs> so we are trying to create something we haven't seen. That, that's, it's, a, it's kind of magic. The software developers, software development is the process of making impossible possible. So at the first round, making Ruby three times fast is impossible. But somehow, we can do n na nasty things <laughs> <laughs> by using technologies, ideas, with help from genius and the community. So the, the difficulty and the pain are cause of the cre creation. We know it's hard. Every single simple goal is hard. But we have to keep trying. We have to keep moving forward. And uh, endure until we accomplish. We will help you. The Ruby is the way that I try to help you guys to implement great software. So we can help each other. So I help you, you help me, we ask. So together we can make it. And then this talk is special appreciation to Vladimir and Microsoft. Uh, happy hacking and make impossible possible. Thank you.
So you mentioned that MGIT might be slower in some cases. I'm wondering if you're planning to give some API to disable it explicitly, if I know that my program may not benefit from it, that it might be slower with MGIT than, than without it. Yeah, you have to turn on MGIT by explicitly. So by default, uh, uh, the, you can run the, your Ruby so code. So by default, that. it will be off, and I need to turn it on explicitly, or by default, it will be on? You have to turn on explicitly. OK. By okay. default, it, 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 the performance is the, the, the same. OK, got it. Thank you. Um, hi. Uh, so um, uh, pardon my ignorance, but so the point of JIT is that you, instead of interpreting the program when you run it, you compile it into C, into like a shared object, and then you kind of execute that object on the right. target platform. Correct. OK. And interpret, so the way it is done now works how? So how do you how do you interp how do you run I mean I'm sorry to ask that <laughs> but how do you actually run Ruby at the moment like how does the interpreted way work Yeah yeah the, you compile the your Ruby code in in C by uh, converting out LTL to the C code okay. corresponding C code then compile them by the C compiler then go the load and dynamically, then link into the, you know, replace the the implementation with the C, uh, the Ruby implemented the root method by the those kind of the loaded C function. So that 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 must just run the the method implemented in C. So, but that that's the that's the JIT, right? That's the JIT. Okay, and and the, how does it work? Like at the moment we don't have JIT, right? At the moment we have interpreted. Mm -hmm. The inter but I never understood how the actual interpretation process works. Like, so the, there's Ruby code, and then we have the Ruby VM. Yeah. And you basically compile the my Ruby code into instructions for the Ruby VM. Yes. <coughs> and then the VM. VM does, does does fits the one instruction at the time. Okay. 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 And that's obviously slower because you have to interpret the code. Yeah. OK, OK. Well, now I finally understand what JIT is. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> Any other questions? <laughs> OK. Uh, it fundamentally the same. So the, under the, the virtual machine, you have to convert back and forth in the, in the C structure and the Ruby data types. And then in the converted C code, you have to you do the same. So the, the cost you can remove from the, the virtual machine is the, the fetching the, the code and the, the, the conditioning or something like that. So the make the, the control faster, not the, the the data process itself. So you have to send the method in, in a dynamic way. So you have to fetch the, the value in dynamic way or something like that. That won't change. Okay. So that, that is the reason so the, the MJ runs three times faster, not a hundred times faster. What time? Hey. Thank you.